by the way, until we get, well, I've got the special report on the controlled burn and then the two interviews. So let's get to what the EPA says about this, though. This is what's critical to understand. And Eric Coppolino, who is a, a host on uh, planetwaves.fm, I believe, I found his article on Substack. And he's been studying these dioxins since the 1990s. And he told me that he's been saving this uh, collection of documents and just boxes of evidence, documents that he's had for all these years, you know, going up on uh, almost 30 years. And now the issue has come back around again because of this train you know, disaster in East Palestine. But what you need to understand most importantly is that when you burn chlorinated substances, which means essentially, although this is a simplified version, but it means almost any substance with chlorine in it. Okay. So PVC, polyvinyl chloride. PVC is made of, of course, chlorine as an element. So there are other elements in the molecule, namely a carbon and a hydrogen. So you combine chlorine, carbon, and hydrogen, and you get PVC. If you burn PVC, you produce crazy, insanely toxic substances known as dioxins. And the most toxic of these substances is called 2378 or TCDD for short. And it's referred to in both ways, TCDD or 2378. And it contains chlorine plus hydrogen plus oxygen. The oxygen is combined into the molecule during combustion. So you know how combustion has to have some form of oxygen for combustion or you know a fire to continue to burn. Well, during the fire, the dioxins are formed. This is what a lot of people don't understand. They think that if you burn something like vinyl chloride or if you burn PVC, it just goes away. It doesn't. If you burn PVC, you create dioxins unless you burn it at crazy high incineration temperatures, which is a couple thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So check this out from the EPA. I'm looking at uh, archive.epa.gov. Waste, non-hazardous waste and municipal solid waste. All right, here's what it says. Under dioxins, backyard burning is a particular health concern because it produces significant quantities of dioxins. Dioxins and dioxin-like compounds are a group of 30 highly toxic chlorinated organic chemicals. They can be produced through industrial processes such as chlorinated chemical manufacturing and metals smelting. Currently, however, the largest quantified source of dioxin emissions is the uncontrolled burning of household trash, that is backyard burning. Studies have shown, now this is, listen carefully, this is the EPA, folks. It's not me saying this, this is the EPA. Studies have shown that just small amounts of chlorinated materials in waste are required to support dioxin formation when burning waste. This means that even when materials contain, uh, containing high levels of chlorine, such as PVC, are removed from household trash, burning the remaining waste still creates dioxins. Because, and get this, nearly all household waste contains trace amounts of chlorine. Understand? Any kind of incineration of backyard trash releases dioxins, which are toxic at less than parts per trillion concentration. That's, that's me saying that, that's not the EPA. But continuing with the EPA, here's what else they say, okay? Much of the dioxins created and released into the air through backyard burning settle on plants. These plants are, in turn, eaten by meat and dairy animals, which store the dioxins in their fatty tissue. People are exposed to dioxins primarily by eating meat, fish, and dairy products, especially those high in fat. Backyard burning occurs commonly in rural farming areas, where dioxin emissions can more easily be deposited on animal feed crops and grazing lands. These dioxins then accumulate in the fats of the dairy cows, the beef, poultry, and swine, making human consumption of these harmful chemicals difficult to avoid. And this is what's happening all around East Palestine. They set fire to the vinyl chloride, which is a, a monomer. It's not poly, it's, it's the mono version of it, the monomer. 
They set fire to it. It created dioxins in the fire. The fire was the factory that created the dioxins, including 2378 TCDD. These dioxins then fall out of the sky. They land on the farms, the trees, the grass, the sidewalks, the, the car roofs and hoods and doorknobs and buildings and the parks, the dirt roads, the rivers and creeks, everything. And then that's what the animals are grazing on. So this is how it gets into the food supply. So the EPA continues. Dioxins are classified as persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic pollutants. Those are called PBTs. P means persistent. B is bioaccumulative. T is toxic. So PBTs. PBTs, says the EPA, are highly toxic, long-lasting substances that can build up in the food chain to levels that are harmful to human and ecosystem health. Persistent means they remain in the environment for extended periods of time. Bioaccumulative means their concentration levels increase as they move up the food chain. As a consequence, animals at the top of the food chain, such as humans, tend to have the highest dioxin concentrations in their bodies. So you see, when, when we get the dioxin add-on in our laboratory and we start testing food for dioxins, we're going to be testing meat and milk and cheese and eggs. But we'll also be testing soil samples and water samples from the area. But we're going to test for the bioaccumulation of these PBTs. Yeah, you, you don't want PBTs in your BLTs, you know, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. You don't want PBTs in there. <laughs> it can kill you. So from the EPA, dioxins are potent toxicants with the potential to produce a broad spectrum of adverse effects in humans. Dioxins can alter the fundamental growth and development of cells in many ways that have the potential to lead to many kinds of impacts. These include adverse effects upon reproduction and development, suppression of the immune system. Oh, gee, what a wonderful time to have suppressed immune systems. Um, Disruption of hormonal systems and cancer. For more detailed information, read the EPA's dioxin and related compounds website, and it links to the EPA. And then we find out that, you know, the EPA is changing its allowable level of dioxin exposure to increase it by a thousand times. And that proposed change happened in January. <laughs> That's right. About a month before the train wreck the, quote, accident. Mm -hmm. So this is not me saying that dioxins are created from the combustion of chlorinated compounds. That's the EPA saying it. And by the way, every chemist knows this and every chemist would confirm this, unless they're lying. If you combust chlorinated compounds, you get dioxins, okay? It's just, it's cause and effect, it's chemistry. And it's the EPA saying that these are PBTs, Persistent Bioaccumulative Toxic Pollutants, PBTs, okay? Remember that, PBTs. Pretty bad toxins, you could say. PBT, pretty bad. And it's the EPA saying that these rise through the food chain and that they bioaccumulate, they end up at the fats of animals and the animal products, such as milk and cheese and eggs and so on, that end up being consumed by humans and that it's humans at the top of the food chain that then get the highest exposure to these dioxins, and it's the EPA saying that these cause cancer and immune system suppression and development problems, reproduction problems, hormonal problems, okay? That's all EPA saying that. That's not me. And if anybody in the media were honest, I'm talking about the mainstream corporate media, they would be reporting this every hour of every day, but they're covering it up. They're lying to America. They're saying that none of that's true. They're saying that there are no dioxins. They're saying that nothing's dangerous. They're saying, go back to your homes. In fact, the EPA is saying that, which is just inconceivable. It's inconceivable that the EPA would do that because the EPA's own website tells you how toxic this stuff is. And they know that they set fire, the railroads set fire to the chlorinated compounds. They, the EPA knows dioxins are raining down upon the land. Let me tell you, any scientists out there that want to blow the whistle on this and join me in this, I've interviewed EPA whistleblowers before, such as Dr. David Lewis. In fact, 
Maybe we should reach out to him and see if we can get him on to talk about this. But if there are other scientists out there, if you want to come on with me and blow the whistle on this, especially if you're an EPA scientist, we'll protect your identity. Okay, you will we'll change your voice. You don't have to show your face, but you do have to prove to us off the air that you are who you say you are. We're going to need to check your ID. We're going to need to see, you know, proof that you work for the EPA or wh whoever you work for. We're going to check you out, but we won't share that publicly, okay? We'll protect your identity from the public. If you want to come on and join us in blowing the whistle on this, because we are talking about, again, the worst ecological catastrophe that has been unleashed in American history. And as Dr. David Lewis taught us, talking about biosludge, uh, guess where all this stuff ends up? It, it ends up in the biosolids that then get spread on farms where animals graze and food is grown, the food that ends up in your grocery store. This is an ecological, it's an act of war against our country. And, and let me add that Eric Coppolino, by the way, is calling for the immediate arrest of every official that is complicit in allowing this to happen and in covering it up. He's called for that in the interview that you're about to hear here. Actually, you're going to see it because we filmed it with video. And I don't know that I can say at this point that I'm calling for their arrest, but I certainly would call for an investigation potentially leading to an arrest if it shows that they were complicit in this. Okay, so I would support that conditionally. But we have to know that they knew that they were poisoning the world, essentially, not just America. This is also going to affect Canada as well. This is an international ecological terrorism or catastrophe event, however you want to phrase it. It's bad. It's, it's like America got bombed, chemical bombed. So here's what I want to do. Let's jump into the interview with Eric Coppolino. It's um, maybe 40 minutes or so. And then after that, I'll have the report for you about the big lie of the, quote, controlled burn. And then wrapping it up today, we'll have the interview with Dr. Mihail Chia, if I'm pronouncing that correct, correctly. And then we'll wrap it up on the other side of that, okay? So here we go. Let's jump into the interview with uh, Eric Coppolino. And I think you'll find it truly fascinating, a little bit horrifying. But folks, the only place you're getting the truth right now is from the independent media. And I want to say, you know, Eric Coppolino comes from a network that's more left-leaning, and my network is more, you know, right-leaning, conservative-leaning. But, folks, it doesn't matter. This, this transcends all politics. This is about human survival. This is about whether we can even have children, whether we have a food supply that functions. This is about us being under a chemical attack. This is war against humanity. It doesn't matter who somebody voted for in this moment, we've got to sound the alarm on this massive ecological catastrophe. And we are, just to confirm, we are calling for the immediate total evacuation of the town of East Palestine and surrounding areas that were impacted by this. We're calling for immediate dioxin testing across the whole area, the fallout zone, all of it. And if the testing shows dioxin levels, we're calling for the permanent evacuation of that town, the total re remediation, all the buildings are going to have to be torn down. The soil is going to have to be scraped off and replaced. There's going to have to be mass controlled incineration in a, a hazardous waste incineration facility to get rid of these dioxins. That's, that's the only way to do this. Break it down into carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and chlorine as separated elements. You have to use crazy high temperatures in order to do that. Okay. And then that's the only safe outcome here. You've got to burn these at thousands of degrees. Then you get rid of them. But just setting fire to them at, at relatively low temperature does not do that. That just releases them into the air. So here goes the interview. Enjoy. Welcome to the Health Ranger Report on Brighteon.tv. I'm Mike Adams, the Health Ranger and the founder of Brighteon. And today we have a really extraordinary first-time guest. This is the first time I've ever had the chance to speak with him, but he really impressed me with an article on Substack, and his name is Eric F. Coppolino, and uh, he's, we'll, I'll allow him to introduce himself, but he's been studying dioxins and the toxicity from dioxins for about 40 years. And let's see, he's the host of planetwaves.fm, 
on the Pacifica Radio Network. And you can find his Substack page by going to planetwaves.org, O-R-G. And there he has a resource guide on dioxins. And I think that he has some very uh, critical information for humanity to share with us today. Mr. Coppolino, uh, thank you so much for what you've done, uh, for what you're doing, for educating people and sounding the alarm, and welcome to the show. Mike, thank you. Doing my best. And I've long wanted to meet you, and I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, but here we find ourselves doing the thing that we came here to do. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, we live in this toxic world where there are all these cover-ups, where it seems like nobody in a position of power or authority wants to tell the truth about what's going on, and people are being exposed to all of this. And right now, the railroad company, Norfolk Southern, is paying people $1,000 to sign away all future potential liability lawsuits, whatever, for a thousand bucks that they're buying them off. That's happening yeah. right now. Uh, obviously, that's out of ignorance. So tell us, please, Mr. Coppolino, uh, where where should we begin to understand uh, dioxins and the combustion products of chlorinated compounds and what this means to the future of our world here? Well, what happened uh, two weeks ago, a little bit more, I guess, is a um, it's an unimaginable worst case scenario. I mean, if, if someone had put together uh, what they thought would be the, the worst possible environmental disaster involving dioxin. It would be something like what happened and then further uh, compounded by the fact that the railroad, apparently with consent of the governor, uh, conducted a dump and burn operation of a, of a chemical called vinyl chloride monomer. So first of all, this is a worst case scenario. And w before I get into the history, just because you haven't heard about it doesn't mean that it's not a a, a, a persistent problem uh, that has, you know, basically been known since 1949 and in other forms prior to that. But in 1949, the dioxin molecule was identified by Monsanto after an incident very similar to this in a place called Nitro, West Virginia. I'm going to add that to my list. And the and and. This was a toxin discovered of such unimaginable potency that it, it could, it would kill rabbits by merely putting it on their ears. And then when they put another rabbit into the same cage without putting it into their ears, onto their ear, the, that next rabbit would die. Wow. So this is a toxin uh, that is of un Com incomprehensible potency. Um, the um, I know you referenced my aspirin tablet metaphor that actually comes from Peter Montague, a, sci a science historian. And in in fact, the weight of one aspirin tablet, about five grains or 325 milligrams, contains what the EPA falsely says is the safe quote quote safe lifetime dose for 32 million people. That's unbelievable. One, the weight of one aspirin tablet. So the weight of 10 aspirin tablets w would be the the claim, this is false, I'll get into why this isn't the second threshold dose for the entire United States. You could fit this into an envelope and mail it for one stamp. And a heck of a lot more uh, of that has, has been produced and there there is n no telling how much was created. So. I will get into the history and the chemistry of it, but I want to say, in case people do, don't get very far in this program, let's start with the most important thing. The children and the pregnant women have to be evacuated immediately. Any woman or girl who wants to have children needs to be evacuated immediately. Based on the precautionary principle and the fact that there has been no dioxin testing conducted whatsoever, the entire town needs to be evacuated and basically relocated. Now, I know nobody wants to hear this, but the consequences of just staying there and toughing it out are, are not going to be good. Well, let me let me jump in here because Please. what you're saying is this is breaking news. And I agree with your assessment, by the way, this town needs to be evacuated and it needs to be remediated with no one uh, no one living there, obviously, and it may take years to remediate this. Uh, and even then, you know, you look at look at the half life of this substance in the in the soils. But is there it is also? None. I mean, it never goes away. Re is that really? I that's a fact. I this thought does not break down. Okay, 
I thought that it was like microbes could help break it down over a century or so, like a half-life of 50 to 100 years. This is theorized. But, this has okay. not been demonstrated. There, there's been so little. I mean, we're, we're familiar with how much information was concealed about cannabis by making it illegal. There were yes. no studies. No one could get permission to do it. It was incorrectly put on Schedule 1, et cetera, et cetera. It's a similar situation with dioxin where it's an unregulatable chemical because any amount is toxic, no matter how small. The stuff is measured in femtograms. That's unreal. And in parts per quadrillion. Yeah. So this is not an, an issue that is a well known. It, it has been silenced by the by the corporate media for three decades. So so for those the listening, most um, recent serious investigation was by me in 1994. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I, I appreciate you bringing all this in. A femtogram, I believe, is one one millionth of one one billionth of a gram. Right. So a femtogram is six orders of magnitude away from a nanogram. Correct. So well, it goes nan nanogram, I think, picogram, nano, femtogram. Pico, femto. But the the yeah. thing is, the, like, we're talking of amounts so small you cannot conceive of it, and right. it, you know the 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 weight of the air you're breathing is far heavier. Un unreal. So so if if a person gets one drop of this substance on their body, like that's that's actually maybe hundreds of thousands of times the maximum lifetime exposure, yeah. something like that. Yeah. And it's a, but it's a slow acting poison. That's the thing. It's not likely to be um, an acute, immediately deadly toxin in adults, but it can be for children. It can be for fetuses. It can be for many, many different kinds of animals, though they have very different um, types of um, sensitivities. Some are much more sensitive than, than others. Uh, and and then it is a long term contaminant uh, for everyone, mainly deriving most of its power from being a, a hormone disruptor. It's uh -huh. a hormonal toxin. And that's, so, that's where it gets most of its power, in addition to being a carcinogen, but that too is connected to the hormonal action. So then the, the results of this exposure that it is taking place and that has taken place, the, the curve of the timeline of this may stretch out for decades before generations. we go to full generations. Unreal. Yeah, because it's a multi-generational poison. According to a Dow chemical study kept secret by the EPA conducted in, in the 1970s, they found that, that second generation and third generation rats had the same if effects as if they had personally been exposed. That's, that's unbelievable. And this is not I, a joke. And in yeah. your article too, I noticed that looking at the history of the of the lawsuits on this and so on and you you've done obviously you've covered this for a long time and i really want to give you credit because you, you did an extraordinary job there and continue to do so but monsanto came right back into the picture monsanto the history of monsanto agent orange dioxins and you know gave me flashbacks of all the all the horrible things monsanto did to try to cover up gmos and glyphosate so mm -hmm. you know it's the same corporations that are uh, killing humanity with these toxic chemicals. I was not surprised to see Monsanto as part of this. The problem here is that nobody was supposed to light the freaking chemical on fire. Right. I mean, th there, there was some uh, seriously misguided um, decision-making going on there because you couldn't have done anything worse with dioxins. Particularly, I mean, to my knowledge, and there, there may be more, but we're looking at nine carloads of um, chlorinated chemicals. Uh, five of them were, were vinyl chloride monomer, a precursor to polyvinyl chloride, and four seemingly, well, classified non-hazardous cars full of PVC pellets. And they all burn. So we had nine cars full of these chlorinated compounds burning, but they were burning in the presence of non-chlorinated compounds, which then add the hydrocarbons to the, to the mix. And so when you add the chlorine burning to the hydrocarbon burning, you get chlorinated hydrocarbons of which dioxin is by far the, the most potent. Um, and it, it will certainly be there. Well, this That's is why, why they buried I, the freaking ditch. They buried, they buried the, the pit. Right, right. But I want to ask you, has anybody done the math on the chemistry of this, of determining what mass of the various dioxin compounds, what's the total aggregate mass or estimates of that, that would have been the result of the combustion of the vinyl chloride that, that was ignited? Any idea? There, there's no way to predict that. And I mean, I'm sure that, that, that a kind of a theoretical chemist could 
a you know number crunch it, but we don't even know how many tons of material, uh, in fact, burned, and it was all burned at a diversity of different temperatures. Right. Um, and you know the the stuff is supposed to be burned at like two thousand degrees. These fires were not nearly that hot, and so when even burning it at 2,000 degrees, you will still get new dioxins created. Uh, and this stuff was burned at low temperatures in a completely open, unfiltered, uncontained burn, along with some 10 or 15 or 20 other rail cars burning. And and you don't need a lot of dioxin to a lot of chlorine to, to make dioxin. Yeah. So so speak to, to what you just said is really critical. Thank you for pointing it out. When when you try to remediate dioxin contaminated soils and you go to something called incineration, as you said, that requires extremely high temperatures to break apart these very tough molecules, these, these yeah. chlorinated compounds. But if you burn at a lower temperature, what you're actually doing is you are distributing the toxin. Yeah. So you're, you're yep. forming and compounds yeah. and then you're distributing them. But you notice how the media says this is a controlled burn. Controlled. Oh, what a joke. <laughs> right. What a complete joke. Throwing a flare in a pit full of a ke volatile chemical as a controlled burn, <laughs> please. No, I Talk mean, what a cover Newspeak. story. Yeah. No, it's not controlled at all. I mean, it's going into the air and then the wind is taking it and, and the fallout is happening. That's not controlled. You know, if, no. if somebody did this, if a terrorist did something like this, I mean, it would be called an act of ecological terrorism. It was an act of ecological terrorism, and everybody who was involved should be held criminally liable. Agreed. They should be in custody now. Yes. There should be a grand jury impaneled now. I don't really foresee that happening in, in a place like Ohio, uh, but, you know, a well, boy can dream. So let's talk about what the real risks are. One, one, of, the, one of the problems is how, how this spreads. And and um, it, it's going to spread through every vector. I mean, there's a massive plume in the atmosphere that is probably not that far from where it started, which really means kind of, you know, draw a 500 mile circle a around East Palestine. And that's pretty much your exposure area right out to, to the to the East Coast. Um, and then it's so it's going to come down in the rain. Uh, it's going to be moved around by atmospheric movement. And then we have a further problem of movement by dust. This is a very serious problem with dioxin because where it's settling, it's going to eventually bind with the soil. And then in the, in the dry weather, that soil is going to flake apart and become volatilized. Um, and, uh, and, and forest and fires, make, forest fires. Well, Th yeah, that but can just, re just ordinary distribute. dry dirt, yeah. even a drought of any kind. Right. Any dust at all. Um, so this summer, there could be another spread, a secondary spread. It's just going to be continuous. Right. And it's continuous. So, and, and of course, I know you're familiar far more than I am with, with the history of dioxins, but uh, Times Beach, Missouri, right? They were, they were spraying, what, dioxin-contaminated motor oil on dirt roads to try to keep down the dust? Well, and, it was really being used as a dioxin dump. Right, it was a, a town right. in Missouri a was being dump, used yes. as a dump by Monsanto. The stuff was all coming out of St. Louis, and and being given or sold or, or, or paid to, to a guy named Russell Bliss, who then basically dumped it over and over and over again. I mean, the, 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 we're told oh that it was uh, you spray to keep the du the dust down, but this is like the min minimalist version of this this series of events. The stuff was massive quantities were dumped on the town. Uh, so that is not really a point source. That is a destination. That It became a dump site. And of course, that town was completely leveled, incinerated, and, and turned into some crazy Route 66 state park. Unreal. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it, but it, it also, it, it brings up the point that, you know, interestingly, back then, and what was that, the early 70s? 70 that was the, the that that issue came to a head in 1978 78 the dump oh no 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 i'm sorry the well that was made, coming to a head around the, around the same era but the dumping was going on from the 60s to the 70s i'm sorry i got confused okay. with love canal for uh, for a second which is another uh, comparable situation to to this but the neighborhood in niagara falls new york what i'm trying to point out isn't it interesting that back then the 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 mainstream media was covering it. Today, 
we see in East Palestine, we see just denial, just total denial out there by the media and the government and the EPA and the corporation that's involved yeah. here. So yeah. every authority is pretending that this is not a problem. And it smacks of Chernobyl. It smacks of the Soviet Union, 1986, saying, ah, oh, there's no radiation problem here. It's, mm -hmm. it's practically, and in, in, in many ways, this is more dangerous than radiation, by the way. I would, would you, agree. Oh, please, it's a matter ahead. of how much you get, but you know, you don't want to choose your poison, really, right? But, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, it's it's a, it's a huge problem. Now, there's a history to how this became an open secret. There's because the, I mean, the number of towns where this has happened include Love Canal, Nitro, West Virginia, Seveso, Italy, Vertac in Jacksonville, Love Canal, New Paltz, New York, Binghamton, New York. Five Rivers, Oregon, Bloomington, Indiana, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and others wow. that, that essentially became these kind of ground zero locations of, of massive dioxin re releases. But here's what happened in the, in the early 1990s um, was that a newsletter editor uh, who produced like a one-page front and back newsletter every week, Peter Montague, P Dr. Peter Montague, uh, quoted government documents and court records about dioxin and and Monsanto put up one of the scientists who did one of the studies that was completely fraudulent uh, to sue him and provided him with an attorney to sue Peter Montague. Um, it was a very bad move. They did not anticipate the, the judge granting broad discovery motions to prove that what uh, Dr. Montague published was true. But even that, well, and then, and then, William Gaffey died before the lawsuit could go to trial, but not, not after the entire press was warned off of the issue because it, it would seem to lead to a potentially lead to a lawsuit. And then something else happened, which is also in the early 90s. The New York Times ran a six part page one series by a writer named Keith Schneider about how dioxin is not as serious as previously believed and people believed it. And yeah. that was also about 30 years ago. So the issue came to a head in the 70s and 80s. It was still peaking in the early 1990s with the federal government's reassessment of the toxicity of dioxin, which said that it was uh, orders of magnitude worse than previously hoped or believed and then suddenly uh, the, the, the lawsuit against Montague and the fake New York Times coverage, the, the, the issue went away from the press. Now you skip ahead 30 years when I have a conversation with a, with a chemist and I'm talking to chemists, they don't really understand the, the actual issue. They, they understand I can help, they can help me with the molecule, right? They can help me understand the, the formation of the molecule and then all this stuff, but they're not versed on the on the issue, on of the toxicity. It's been kept quiet so long. Yeah, well, and this is you know this is the history of powerful corporations and regulatory capture in yeah. America under every administration. It's not left or right. It's corporate infiltration of government. We saw it with big tobacco, right? We saw it with GMOs. We see it with pesticides. We see it with. I mean, everything you can imagine, right? You know, arsenic and baby food, right? You name it. Or lead and gasoline uh, before that was taken mm. out for the most part, right? I mean, they were, they were, cars driving down the road in the 1970s were just spewing lead all over, yep. all in the air. I mean, yep. wow. And we were yep. told it's all safe. So, oh, yeah. The people are, are, especially with this, the people in East Ohio are saying the EPA is lying to us. You know, they're getting red pilled big time right now. Of mm -hmm. course, they're lying to you. Yes. The, the lying has gone on for generations and it's not going to stop now. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's a special game played with dioxin and it is by far the, the most pernicious of the environmental games because to, to bring up the dioxin issue and now the dioxin issue is up. I mean, there's going to be no, no getting around that. Um, the, the most um, th th this most toxic chemical leads to the most toxic games played by particularly federal, but also state authorities. And when it comes time to testing, this is when the 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 playbook needs to be understood that there's a there's a playbook here, and that playbook involves testing in the wrong places, testing for the wrong chemical, right. testing by the wrong <laughs> method. 
um, losing test results, losing the samples themselves, quote unquote, losing, losing, um, and every other game imaginable down to burning down the homes of people with massive document collections in their homes, which was more of an issue when the documents were not kept on the internet as they are today. Uh, but th there's no limit to how far these corporations and the government will go to suppress this issue. Yes. And they, you know, they may have forgotten how bad it is themselves. You know, I, um, I interviewed a scientist, a former EPA whistleblower, Dr. David Lewis, and uh, I, I produced a film called Biosludged, uh, which is free, folks. If you want to watch it, it's at biosludged.com. But that's about the biosludge accumulation. And you know what Dr. Lewis told me? He said, any terrorist that wanted to distribute a toxic substance in America, mm -hmm. all they have to do is dump it in one sewage uh, port, you know, one, one sewage drain, and then the city will distribute it across all, all the farms and fields and parks and everywhere that they're dumping all this bio sludge. Well, yep. think about dioxins now. So dioxins are, are moving down the Ohio River into the Mississippi and into the Gulf, ultimately. And th mm -hmm. think about all the cities that use those as water sources, including mm -hmm. Cincinnati, by the way. And then that's going to get flushed down the toilet. That's going to go into the bio sludge in all those cities. So bio sludge, or I think it's called bio solids in a lot of these cities, it's going to be a dioxin accumulation cesspool, and mm -hmm. they're going to spread that on the farms, folks. And there's going to be uptake by farm animals. There's 75,000 farms in Ohio, probably a comparable number in Pennsylvania. Most of them are family farms. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing that is so bad that you, you would think that society would be organized around making sure that it never happened. But what we have is quite the contrary, a society organized around basically making sure that it happened. I mean, how many thousands of tons of material were, were, were on, on those trains with just two employees and one trainee on that train? There were just three guys running, uh, running that train. And then every, every bad decision was made in terms of how you want to contain this. You don't want to, you don't want to take the entire thing and, and dump it into the atmosphere. Right. I mean, this will come down in the rain basically everywhere. There'll be some, eventually, some measurable level um, in the rain. I, I can't believe I'm even saying this. Um, I, I, I assume the issue was dead because nobody cared about it anymore. And I have maintained my, my document collection and my contacts and my archives the best I could over, you know, the, the essentially... 39 and a half years I've been on, on this issue. And now suddenly it is right in our faces. Well, uh, Eric, may, may I call you Eric? Sure. Uh, um, let's collaborate on this because um, I don't know if you heard my announcement, but uh, in our food science lab, we, we have a triple quad mass spec and we're, we're just now acquiring a gas chromatography interface. Oh, really? Uh, yes. And we were, this is going to be up and running in about 90 days. And it will allow us to get a peak response, uh, you know, a visible peak of two femtograms uh, that's load on column with a one microliter injection. In other words, we're going to have, you know, parts per billion, sub parts per billion sensitivity on this sure, instrument. That's, that will work for this, but don't ruin your equipment. You need somebody really experienced w with dioxin per se. You don't want to ruin all of this new gear. No, no, we, we, uh, we're getting training from the manufacturer, they're coming in-house and to do the training on this. We already run these instruments with uh, for glyphosate detection. So mm -hmm. we're already familiar with the software and everything. And importantly, we're not handling um, dioxin external standards. So we're not going to be able to get a an actual full quant uh, result, but rather more just a, a pass fail or a semi quant result. Cause I don't want to handle those external standards, but we can work with you, Eric, and the people that you know, you can send us samples and we can run tests on them and get you back results that are kind of pass fail or even some of the chromatography peaks. And you can trust us because we're not the EPA. You yeah. know, we're not working no, for the I'd railroad. Do it than anybody. I don't even trust labs when I send out samples. Yeah. To, 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 I don't know who owns the, owns the lab. So you're, you're as good as it gets in this, uh, in this game. You can, you can trust us. And uh, again, give us 90 days to get this new interface up and running. We already have the instrument. This is just a gas 
chromatography interface that connects with the instrument. Mm -hmm. We've been running this instrument for years on glyphosate, and mm -hmm. we're getting like uh, uh, five parts per billion limit of quantitation on the glyphosate. But we'll be able to do dioxins, and we, we need to work with people like you who have networks of contacts in Ohio, in the Amish farms, in Pennsylvania. We've got to get samples. We need soil. We need water. We need grass. We need, you know, we need samples. And then we'll do the testing. Yeah. Well, they have to be collected correctly, and the the places they need to be collecting now, because we're about, you know, maybe entering some kind of a first round of, of testing, and we have to keep the pressure on. We have to get the EPA to admit this is an issue, first of all. Uh, but they need to be testing on rooftops right now. Mm, good point. That's the most important thing. And air intakes, rooftops and air intakes, because they're not going to be disturbed so badly uh, by 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 foot traffic and vehicular traffic, and you'll, you'll get your your cleanest sample. So, um, we you know, and and there's a sampling. You need a, a sampling kit includes hexane and the right bottle without plastic and so forth. Uh huh. I don't know the current protocols. I've never done. I've never personally done dioxin uh, testing, only PCBs and glyphosate. Well, I haven't done so, dioxin testing either, but but you're right. And I'll, I'll have my lab team find out the proper protocols so we can do this correctly. Uh, but no matter what we find, you can bet the EPA is going to argue with it and say, no, that can't be. No, we, we certified it's all good. <laughs> you know? Well, but that's also how you force their hand. And, you, and then there has to be a third party who's not paid for uh, by, by the rail by the railroad uh, who, who who's functioning independently and there will be what are called there need to be what are called split samples yeah the same place sampled has to be sent to two labs independently of one another so that the the results can be compared and both labs are aware there's going to be split samples and and therefore they're more likely to do an, an honest job so in the immediate yes. sense there has to be dioxin mapping and we have to even have a, a pass fail which of course uh, i don't think it's gonna pass i mean it's obviously they're gonna find it with this this astounding it's just incomprehensible i mean the entire quantity of love canal was twenty three thousand tons of waste that was at least kept under the ground for the most part and in a kind of a cool place here you had a comparable amount of of, of chemical stock burning suddenly in the open air. So this was just like L Love Canal turned inside out and lit on fire. Unbelievable. I, I, I it's, mean, it's, it's just, it's unthinkable that someone would do this. Now, let me, let me ask you, Eric, again, I want to give out your website where people can follow you, planetwaves.fm. You're the host, you're part, uh, you're the lead of the Chiron Returns investigation, in investigative team. Is that correct? Yeah, Chiron Return investigative team. ChironReturn.org if you want to find us. Okay. And then you have planetwaves.org. It gets people to your Substack page. But, yes. And you've been covering this for, what, you said 40 years? Well, I've, I first we got I got into the issue when I was a 19-year-old a uh, features editor for the Campus Magazine at SUNY Buffalo. And I read in the Buffalo News that the uh, that the state of New York wanted to um, rehabitate the Love Canal area after five years earlier a massive evacuation of 700 families, and then just a few years later the state was talking about you know painting the houses and changing the street names and changing the name of the neighborhood and then selling the houses oh. to <laughs> unsuspecting people, houses that were bought out in the Superfund Unreal. buyout. Um, and I, that was that was my first investigative feature as a 19 year old. Wow. And then I, I did, you know, many tours of duty in journalism, business and public public higher ed and got dragged in in 91 when there was a toxics release. I can send you um, B-roll B photos if you'd like um, a toxics release. Uh, due to PCB transformers exploding on the campus of the State University of New York at New Paltz. Oh, wow. And that, I, oh, so that was my kind of trial by fire where my community experienced a, a dioxin release. And I, I put the next three years of my life into covering it and then spread out a network of uh, people around, around the world who had, had worked on this issue um, and, uh, you know, learned, learned the entire history and learned, you know, learn the game that the authorities play because I played that game with them as a journalist. And I will tell you that citizen action works in these cases. Citizen 
it works. You must keep the heat on them and not fall for their lies. They're going to put up nozzle heads who say, yeah, it's safe. There's a safe level. Anybody who says there's an acceptable or safe level, you know they're lying. That's, that's how you can tell they're a shill. They say there's a safe level. Of dioxins. Yeah. This is not about vinyl chloride or PVC. This is right. about the combustion products. Right. Those things are bad. These things are – dioxins are stratospherically worse than, than, than those things. And, and yes, this is what we see is in this quest for profit – and I guess in this case, to, to clear the rail lines and get more trains running, you know, instead of dealing with the more involved process of a liquid contaminant that would have to be, you know, uh, pumped and contained and yep. so on. They just said, oh, let's just set fire to it. It'll burn off in a couple of days and then we can reopen the railroad tracks. And, and by doing that, they're exporting the poisons and making it everybody's problem instead of just yep. their problem. Oh, yeah. And the – Yeah. Yes, and the tanker trucks were put on notice that night. I know I have a source in the steel industry who who knows the railroad industry because a lot of steel recycling in the railroad industry said the tanker cars were put on call that night to be available to do a proper disposal of these chemicals. They would really? have had to just pump it into an infinite, probably hundreds of tr trips and tanker cars, and they could have... They could have contained it, but they, they, they not only took a bad course of action, they took the absolutely worst conceivable cause of action. You, you'd have to be quite a science fiction author to come up with a, a worse scenario than this. And I'm, I'm just astonished that, I'm, that we're even having these conversations. But this is, this is where we find ourselves, and we need to get this information to, to people in East Palestine and far around it. Well, we, we absolutely do. Um, we're going to be covering your work. Are you... Are you uh, now, going to your website, let me just bring this up. You've got a resource on your uh, Substack page, which people can reach at planetwaves.org forward to your Substack page. You've got a dioxin resource page for citizens and journalists. Yes. Uh, can you tell us what, what we will learn in that resource guide? Well, it'll take you all the way back. It'll take you all the way back to the discovery of dioxin, uh, depending on which one you read. My The first piece I wrote about this where I uh, took two articles by, by my senior colleague, Peter Montague, and posted them and then put a kind of a long intro on top of it. We'll give you a comprehensive history back to the beginning. But then you're going to learn many side stories. There are important interviews with Carol Van Strum, who, who went through a situation comparable, but again, not nearly as bad as this. Um, in the in the 1970s and and the 1980s, and I'm I'm talking to her every single day. We've we've remained friends for 30 years, so you'll hear two interviews with her. Um, there there is coverage of the way that the New York Times essentially participated with the CDC in a political detoxification. One of the best investigative reports in American journalism history by Vicky Monks called "See No Evil." Hmm. Um, and you'll have my my coverage of, of the history of PCBs, which includes some history of dioxins. Um, there, you know, there are many branches of this story, uh, and I try to keep it down to a kind of compact. It would take about a day to read all these things, but it, it took us the rest of us, you know, half a century to research this. So wow. that's a pretty good, pretty good return to get, get like in a day what took us all 50 years collectively, many people 20, 30, 40, 50 years to, to do. Well, uh, there's a documentary about Times Beach, Missouri, that's also uh, on there as well. Uh, and I'll add I'll add resources to it, and we'll 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 respond to uh, re requests. But the idea here was to bring people up to speed fast. Okay, particularly well, we're, we're going to cover that, and we'll, we'll do some editorial coverage, uh, citing your resource guide, and then also, uh, it, can you recommend? Is there anyone else that I should also be interviewing on on this? You you could, I mean, even off air, you could let us know. I, I want to pursue this issue. Very diligently. You know, unfortunately, there are not a lot of prominent. I mean, I don't. I don't really. I can't really name very many people. There's people I wish we could have, but they're not alive anymore. The attorneys who handled the train car spill in Sturgeon, Missouri, um, and, and litigated Monsanto about its di dioxin problem, which is where a great many documents came out. Peter Montague is in his 80s. I, he's not. I don't think ma making any public appearances at all. And so I was the little kid um, among among these like. For serious people, 
um, when, when I when this happened in my community when I was 27 years old in New Paltz, New York, and um, I've kind of inherited it. I mean, Erin Brockovich has been very outspoken on, on dioxin. Um, she's an incredibly uh, articulate speaker. She's more, you know, doing network news appearances. Reach out to her. Uh, I hear she's going to be in uh, East Palestine on on Friday. Um, we, we may be able to organize getting v video of, of that. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I will reach out to Carol. I don't think she's video capable, though. OK, no, I, kind of it's low, low tech. It's I just want to put that out there and we can have you back on as well. And we can we can collaborate on on some testing, you know, throughout the year. Hopefully, I think that would be ideal. But it, you make a very important point. There aren't a lot of people who can talk about this publicly because it's been it's been so many decades since the Missouri incident, for example, and uh, in New York as well. And so. Yep. You know, this is something that's th this is a ghost of the past that's coming back to haunt us now again in our modern day. And the, the younger generations have have never heard of this before. No, they've never heard of it. I mean, and I, I wondered for a long time why I was like maintaining climate controlled storage for my document collection, um, which, by the way, is also online at Columbia University and at Document Cloud. Those resources are also listed in my primary dioxin. Uh, dioxin resource. Now I know why I've, you know, kept this issue simmering in in the background um, all, yes. all of these years. And I'm grateful there's at least one person who can explain this cohesively uh, and and keep keep the issue in play. And and thanks to Neil Donahue at uh, Carnegie Mellon for being the first person to say the word dioxin uh, in publicly. Uh, you know, it's, it was a low key mention, but it was. It was mentioned, so it is starting to percolate in. But this is the word we need. You need to get this into your social media comments. Post my Substack piece, even where you think it's irrelevant. This issue affects everyone. I mean, Absolutely. this stuff is in every bite of food to some level, and it has never been addressed by the government or the companies. They just keep sweeping it under the rug, and then they keep us they they keep us uh, entertained for three years with a phony virus. Uh, and and <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, I'm covering this thing. I'm, yeah. I'm like day 1100 of my virus coverage, and every day I'm like, what? What is going on here? Like, I I know the dioxin issue, and these people are having complete panic attacks over a respiratory virus that only kills you if you're on remdesivir and a ventilator. Yeah, isn't it amazing how how people's response to real danger is often so misaligned with it, uh, and. In, and the, pr the press helped with this. I mean, around yeah, the clock. for sure, for sure. Um, we were brainwashed. We, we got to wrap this up here. No, nope, but... not at all. We got to wrap this up in a, in a couple of minutes here. But I just want to say also for the record and get your response, Eric. Um, I understand that you know your audience may be more on the political left, more progressive. My audience is more conservative, Christian. But I want to say. People, this issue transcends all politics, damn it. This is about humanity. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle anybody is on. It doesn't matter what you think about presidents or elections when it comes to dioxins. You have no future if you're contaminated yeah. with dioxins. You have no farms, no food, no future, no children, no reproduction, nothing. The politics do not matter, period. Uh, what's your response to that, Eric? Well, that's true. I mean, the you know, this is certainly not a left-right issue. Uh, Bill Clinton is one of the worst defenders in terms of concealing the problem because of uh, Vertac in Jacksonville, Arkansas, um, which was ba basically uh, c concealing a massive dioxin problem created during the Vietnam War, and and Clinton took part in that directly, and then Clinton also stuffed the reassessment of dioxin's toxicity in the early 1990s, very early in his. Um, in, in his administration. And all of this has made me a kind of a former member of the left. Uh, I'm, you know, I think what they're calling us now the anti-war left. Oh, is that right? Or something. Well, I thought the left was supposed to always be anti-war. <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's been a lot of things have kind of 
yes. become completely backwards. And um, look, I mean, even as a former progressive, I've always felt more comfortable with conservatives for some reason, and they seem to like me more. I don't know why I'm a complete freak, but I've always gotten along better with Republicans. So don't go, go, well, go figure you know, that out. Look, it's it's interesting. But, you know, when I was in college, I was uh, I was a Bill Clinton uh, a supporter when I was in college. So there you go. You, you just never know. The more we learn, the more wisdom we gain. You know, it, you find out what's really important. And I got to say right now, folks, we've got to get these toxic chemicals out of our supply chains, our industries, our food, our bodies, or we have no future. We have but no we future. have to get the girls and the young women and the pregnant people out of, of, of East Palestine or anywhere yes. near it. And that town has to be evacuated. And people will be shocked when the guys come in wearing level A moon suits to do the sampling because they know what's going on there and they're going to be they're going to look like buzz aldrin in the photo on mtv wearing the full moon suit with the air packs inside the suit yep. that's what they're going to be wearing when they sample east palestine for dioxins all right so that's that's the breaking news today eric coppolino uh, and we join you in calling for an evacuation of east palestine and the surrounding area where that fallout has taken place, that's uh, that's critical, but especially, as you said, for uh, women of childbearing age and children and pregnant women right now. Yep. What about pregnant Mike, thank men? thank you for helping what me. About, what about pregnant men? Get this word out. <laughs> we have to, <laughs> what about the pregnant men, Eric? We, yeah. Do we have to get them out too? <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> uh, no, I had, to, I had to throw that out there. Uh, world, world's pretty twisted, but uh, folks, nobody should be exposed to these these toxins. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Coppolino, for uh, taking the time for all that you've done. I think your work is extremely important for humanity, and we will invite you back and we'll collaborate with you and we'll do our best to sound the alarm. And thank you. And thank you to all the people who spent hours and hours and hours explaining this issue to me and running copies and mailing me things and introducing me to other people. They're, they're good folks. Yes. They're good folks on this yes. issue. Okay, folks, uh, planetwaves.org gets you to Eric's Substack page and planetwaves.fm gets you to his, his show, his network. And thank you so much, Eric Coppolino, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Mike. All right. God bless. And God bye bless. for now. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. Uh, and for those of you Love watching, you. as always, feel free to repost this. Uh, just give Eric credit. Uh, repost this on any channel, any platform. Uh, I'm Mike Adams, the founder of Brighttown.com, uh, where we can have uncensored free speech discussions like this, but you're free to post it elsewhere as well. Uh, we're, we're in trouble, folks. We, we, we better educate each other and get up to speed or we won't make it through this, uh, this toxic world. Okay. Thank you for watching. I'm Mike Adams. Take care. Okay. Hope you enjoyed that interview. That was hard hitting. Next, I've got a special report here for you, which I recorded earlier. It's about the so-called controlled burn lie, the massive lie of controlled, of, they're claiming it's a controlled burn as if they're pretending that, that gets rid of all the chemicals. It does not. It creates new chemicals, i.e. the dioxins. So give this a listen. And then on the other side, we'll have another interview for you. Here's the special report. The burning of the vinyl chloride in the aftermath of the Norfolk Southern train spill in Ohio it's being called a, quote, controlled burn, but that's a lie. It's a malicious lie. I was on with Steve Bannon yesterday. And I want to thank him for having me on. And he asked me this question, why isn't it a, a controlled burn? You know, in my, in my view, what makes it not a controlled burn? And uh, I had a little bit of time to answer it there, but I need to explain more. So in order to understand this, you've got to understand a little bit about chemistry and dioxins and incineration. So different kinds of molecules require different temperatures of a fire to destroy those molecules. And complete incineration of many of these so-called persistent molecules, which could include things like uh, pesticides or herbicides or you know, chlorinated compounds in this case, or dioxins or what have you, depending on the molecule, Complete incineration can require temperatures beyond 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And controlled incineration, which is what a lot of countries do to biosludge, by the way, they incinerate the biosludge. 
That incineration destroys essentially almost all the molecules and just leaves behind ash, carbon, and minerals, the elements. In other words, it leaves behind the things that are on the table of elements. You know, you have some carbon and some calcium and some magnesium and, and so on, you know, because those don't burn up, right? But what will be destroyed in the incineration are the complex molecules, which are made of things like carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, for example, vitamin C is nothing but carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Did you know that? It's just those three elements arranged in a certain configuration that makes it ascorbic acid. It makes it a vitamin. And the same thing is true with pesticides or herbicides. So uh, glyphosate, for example, you know, it's made of the same basic elements plus phosphorus, and it has um, a phosphate group in it, and it has a certain specific configuration and a certain polarity, a certain affinity in, based on its uh, you know, chemical topography or morphology, as it's called, that gives it its properties to function as a weed killer. Now, if you take glyphosate and you start to break it apart, you get post-glyphosate byproducts, which are things like AMPA. Uh, the, that's just the short acronym for one of the smaller molecules. It's smaller than glyphosate. And then if you keep breaking it down even more, which is what bacteria do in the soils, eventually you just get simple things like ammonia, you know, NH3, or you might get other you know, hydroxyl compounds, uh, depending, depending on what molecule you started with, you're going to get different smaller products as it all degrades. And what's important to understand is that the, the toxicity of glyphosate, when you break it down into things like AMPA, well, AMPA itself doesn't have the same toxicity as glyphosate. It doesn't function as the weed killer. So when you break apart the molecule, you render its toxicity largely ineffective. So when you're looking at dioxins, which are rather large molecules, and, and some of them are you know, very, very complex molecules, lots of chains, uh, lots of sequences of different elements, when you incinerate those molecules, you eliminate their toxicity and you break them down into the carbon, the hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, you know, phosphorus, and so on, which by themselves are essentially harmless. So yes, you can incinerate vinyl chloride in a controlled, high temperature, hazardous waste incinerator, and you can eliminate the vinyl chloride, and you can even incinerate dioxins at very, very high temperature, and you can therefore break them down and eliminate their toxicity. But that is not what happened in uh, East Palestine, Ohio. They set fire to it in an open ditch where it doesn't burn at a sufficient temperature to break down the molecules. And in fact, at the temperatures that you would find typically in an open ditch fueled by a chemical like vinyl chloride, you're actually producing more combustion byproducts. You're not incinerating everything down to its carbon, you know, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. What you're doing is you're creating new toxic compounds that didn't exist before including various dioxins. And dioxins are created from high heat. When you combine high heat with chlorinated compounds, i.e. in a relatively low temperature fire, you get dioxins. It's well known. This is how dioxins are accidentally created in industry. So by burning this in a ditch, they, they produced dioxins. So when the media says it's a controlled burn, it's a lie. It's a malicious lie. It's a damn lie. It's not a controlled burn. It's a dioxin producing fire factory is what that is. And they released it right into the open air. I mean, think about the term controlled. Well, if you control something, it means you have control over it. You can limit its movement. You, you have it contained, for example. Well, they say they have a controlled burn that's a term from forest fires, where you burn a section of, of a, a field or a small forest section in order to create a fire break. It means you intentionally set it on fire because you want to stop this other fire from spreading. That's what controlled burn means. 
the term controlled burn doesn't apply to these chemicals. It's not a controlled burn. It's a dispersal. It's a, it's a synthesis of new toxic molecules and then releasing them into the air where they will fall onto the farms and the rivers and the streams and the rooftops and people's cars and backyards and swimming pools, okay? It's not a controlled burn. It is a deliberate act of ecological terrorism against America. That's what that was. And anybody who says it's a controlled burn either doesn't know what that term means or they're just parroting you know, the mainstream media lies or White House lies or what have you. They're just, it's a cover story. Oh, it's a controlled burn. Well, let me ask you this. If it's controlled, if it was controlled by the railroad, then does the railroad take responsibility for all the effects of that burn since they claim to have controlled it? You know, by definition, even legally, if you claim to control a vehicle and if the vehicle runs over 12 people, then aren't you liable for the vehicle's damage to all of those people, all the fatalities and damage, or if you control an airplane and the airplane flies into a, you know, a, a quickie mart or whatever, aren't you responsible for the damage that that airplane caused to the quickie mart? Well, since Norfolk Southern claims that they controlled this burn, then they are admitting responsibility for all of the cancers, the deaths, the, the abortions, the, the, the dead animals, the food contamination, the property values crashing, this is the railroad admitting that they shall be responsible financially, perhaps legally, perhaps criminally responsible for the fallout of this, this toxic chemical catastrophe. Now think about this, Alec Baldwin, on the movie set of the movie Rust, he pointed a gun at, what was it, one of the, was it a producer or director of photography? He pointed a gun, he pulled the trigger. Not knowing the gun was loaded, he inadvertently, well, you should say, he deliberately pulled the trigger but didn't know it was loaded and so he inadvertently shot this person. Was Alec Baldwin in control of the gun at the time? Yes. 